Well, good. Well, man, well, I, I appreciate your time today. You, uh, I guess before, like before we get started, because, uh, you know, t- so today I'm in learning mode. I really want to learn as much as I can about <laughs> the commercial vehicle side from a sales perspective, both kind of like on the OE production side and then, you know, even the aftermarket world, uh, which is okay. a lot different than, you know, the automotive side, light vehicle side of things. But I guess to kind of start off with, can you tell me a little bit about, I mean, just first of all, like a little bit about your background and maybe your role with, with Meritor? Sure. Yeah. I, I'm uh, at this point, I'm the senior manager for, uh, for breaking components in the aftermarket business for Meritor. And so that, that means uh, all the, the miscellaneous hard parts, if you will, not necessarily the, the friction material on the brakes or, or air disc brake components, but all the drum brake, various components, as well as the drums themselves and, and anything having to do with it in the aftermarket. Um, and I, I've been with the company for over 20 years now. Um, taking a, a variety of different roles. I'd actually start off as a, a college co-op way back when, had product management and sales and operations roles and, and assignments overseas. And, and uh, so it's, it's been pretty wild to, to see the, the changes that have happened um, over the past 20 years, let alone maybe we could also say over the past 12 months for, for that matter. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Now, so are you, are you based out of the Troy, Michigan office or are you in Florence, Kentucky? Great, great question. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually based out of the Florence, Kentucky office. We've got a, uh, Troy, Michigan is our, our global headquarters. And in uh, Florence, Kentucky, just south of Cincinnati is where we have a, our uh, largest distribution center in the world. Uh, packaging uh, occurs there. We've got a, a call, a full call center, as well as all the various functional aspects that you would need to run, uh, run a business. And for us, that, that's the aftermarket business. So we're not a, a sort of a second thought to, to the OE side of things. We run the OE and the aftermarket as, as separate separate focuses, and therefore you, the customer gets the best experience possible. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So from a product management perspective, just kind of at a high level, can you kind of walk me through like mm-hmm. kind of like what your specifically you like what you, what your priorities would be? Um, you know, I guess planning, you know, ahead of time, I guess, for the different products and the, and the, uh, I guess, both on the, I guess, the air disc brake side and the drum brake side. Right. So, so for Meritor uh, as a product manager, it starts getting into a little bit of just how we service or support our, our products, um, production and aftermarket. And so we really have two different sides that an aftermarket product manager actively uh, engages in daily as well as long term. The first is to support whatever goods that we've sold or shipped in a production perspective. So while, while the, the OEM vehicle manufacturer may want to have a full brake assembly, uh, chances are the dealership doesn't want to buy a full brake assembly. They want to buy the nuts and bolts. They want to buy a, a line brake shoe individually. So the, the product manager has to make sure that you've got it set up perhaps as a large assembly because accidents happen and, and you may need that from time to time. But more often than not, what is the smallest proper service component or, or level that, that you need? And are there bills and materials to support it so that you don't have to, okay, I've got this box, now I need nuts and bolts. Well, I didn't put that on my order. You make sure you've got all the goods that you need and, and perhaps any service or support literature included in that box at that time. So that that's sort of the production support side of it. Uh, additionally, we get into sort of the, the aftermarket, pure aftermarket or all makes side of things. And so that gets into... Um, you know, if Meritor doesn't have 100% share of production side, but we know who did get the production business in the commercial vehicle space, can we offer an equivalent product uh, from through one of our various brands, whether that's a new or remanufactured version of that good, to make sure that we, we have all the various um, points of, of service of, of, of the life cycle of that vehicle, and from a price point perspective, from a different options, some people like uh, only touching new goods. Some people prefer remanufactured goods for environmental purposes. Some people like remanufactured good because they, they feel they can get a little bit less expensive and manage the core appropriately versus a new good. So just trying to provide all those options. So a product manager has to think of those two, I guess, lenses or views. Mm-hmm. And then our response is make sure you've got the part number set up, you've got costs, you've got price, you've got inventory driven, you've got support literature, uh, somebody calls in, the, the team on the phone knows what's going on, your sales team is, is articulate and features and benefits and all that sort of stuff. 
can you walk me through, I guess, on the production or the OE side from a sales perspective? Because I, I, I guess how, how is a truck, say a big truck, how is it spec'd for brakes? Like, how does that whole process work? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit different um, versus, say, the, the passenger car side where, where you might say, I want the performance package and the performance package comes with drilled rotors and it comes with a larger caliper and maybe it's painted and, and maybe that also adds a moonroof to it or what, what have you. Uh, on the commercial vehicle side, the, the, uh, the manufacturer is going to dictate what the standard specification is for a brake based on that, that vehicle platform. So they, they might say, uh, for us in 2021, we are using, let's say, Meritor Q-plus brakes as our standard specification on steer and drive axle applications on a straight truck or on a tractor. Okay. Um, then, then oftentimes some alternatives can be offered as well. And so those are usually at a premium. Those usually are not, uh, you know, a, a no charge type scenario. And so, you know, if for some reason a fleet wanted, because they're not buying typically one vehicle, they're typically buying many vehicles. If they were really, really interested, let's say an air disc brake, they could probably go back to that OE and say, I'd like to have air disc brake on my front axle, but I'd like to have Meritor drum brake on my rear axle. And the, the, the OEM might say, well, we can do that. We can get it all engineered and take care of, but there is, because of that, that additional engineering effort, there is a little bit more expense to be associated with, with it. Okay. Okay. So does that, that, that clarify it a little yeah, bit? Yeah, it does. So like if you're, but if you're selling to like say Volvo or Daimler, whoever, mm -hmm. would they, would they build the same model, but say, Hey, we're going to have 50% air disc brakes and 50% drum brakes, or is it kind of more of, Hey, this is the model vehicle, whatever that is. X, Y, Z. They, they, they go into, from a planning perspective, they go into the year with some idea of, this is, this is what we think that the, the, uh, the build rate is going to be so that a supplier like Meritorum Brakes can understand air disc brake, drum brake, what, what quantities are we likely to get going to need to supply? And then within each model then, so it breaks out e even further. So there is, there is that initial indication, but um, the, the, uh, the competitiveness then on the commercial vehicle side is that you are trying to pull your product through where you didn't have standard specification. So, you know, wh whomever it might be from a brake perspective or other, other components on the commercial vehicle side, they're, they're always trying to pull their item through as an option, regardless of what that premium might be, but they're trying to pull that through because they understand that once they have the production seat or, or opportunity that there is the aftermarket to be able to service long-term. Okay, got so it. Sort of a give and take, yin and yang sort of thing. Yeah, got it. Okay. so. If so from an aftermarket perspective, and so if that's how the, that works from the production side, how do you manage the aftermarket? Obviously, you know, so if for, you know, for, for example, if Meritor doesn't win this right. program, whatever, you're not supplying that. Obviously, you're going to have to manage, okay, from the aftermarket perspective, understanding all these different models and then what, what is spec with what brakes, well, this has got drum brakes on this one, this has got air disc pads on this whatever and then right yeah and so that 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 becomes a, a matter of um educating your sales team so that they can have discussions whether it's with the distribution partners the the oem dealer or, or distribute warehouse distributor in the independent channel or the end user whether that's the fleet themselves or perhaps a, a service garage that they have a, a partnership or affiliation with um, so what we'll do is, is look at what the production, um, the production levels were, the build rates were for a given nameplate. Um, we'll, we can look at it by model. We can look at drum versus disc and, and understand what we, what we earn and what we, what we lost. And, and when we lost something, you're, you're likely not going to get a chance to flip somebody's aftermarket business for several years. You're under warranty for that vehicle. Mm -hmm. Once you get out of that period of time, then then some opportunities open up. And so, if if you have a fleet that historically, you know, they they picked a whatever nameplate it might be for their vehicle, and they had Meritor product, and then a change was made, and now they have a little bit of somebody else, they might want to have Meritor service components the entire way through. 
And so getting that, that fleet to understand that that is an option, making sure the dealership or the WD has product available at a local level. But, but again, it, it gets back to educating your team to say, this is the business that we want in production. Therefore, this is first, first thought, how do we support that fully? Um, and, and then secondarily, this is the business we lost. And so if you have account responsibilities for somebody that we didn't have the business historically, how can you go educate your customer differently about the things that we offer that weren't there originally? Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, and typically they're, they're interchangeable items, right? We're not talking about an apples to oranges type of, of conversion. You're saying, hey, this looks like this and operates like this. And here, here's our equivalent of that product or good. So it's, it's usually a, a fairly straightforward discussion, but then it's a matter of how on a local market level, how prevalent is that brand? Is it over distributed? Is it distributed just right? Is it under distributed? You, you get a little bit of a Goldilocks uh, mathematical equation to, to understand what's going on there. And, and that's when a distribution partner says, yes, I'd like to take on that opportunity or no, I'm going to pass on and just keep things how they were initially. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, and then speaking of from an aftermarket perspective, the, the drum brakes, what um, do you happen to know just offhand, like what, what percentage of Meritor's businesses remanufactured drum brakes versus new drum brakes? Um, I, I don't know the, the specific percentage. I, I would say majority plus, it, just, just to give it a safe number, is going to be remanufactured from an aftermarket perspective. That, the vast majority of, of what we sell on the annual basis for brake shoes is going to be remanufactured. Whether those are offered as a line brake shoe or a shoebox kit, Two, break, two line brake shoes with a brake hardware kit included. Um, either way, that, that's going to be the majority of what is done in our, our facility in Plainfield, Indiana. Drum brakes are still widely used, but, you know, air disc brakes is getting a lot of the, the attention these days um, in the market. Um, are you guys seeing still predominantly, are you guys still selling drum brakes for the majority? Yeah, I I, I, th I think what that gets into is, is a little bit of um, more production mindset versus more aftermarket mindset. The production mindset is what is going on today and for the future. Mm. And, and so not, not to deviate it too far, but you can get into topics like electri electrification of the axle or other components, right? Those are very small amount of vehicles in the market being used today that have that technology in place, but it's huge for the potential of the future. Yeah. And so that's why there's a lot of discussion on air disc brake. But um, from an aftermarket perspective, you focus on there are vehicles that are parked somewhere and your job is to get it up and running. And so what does that vehicle have? And so the vast majority um, in the aftermarket are going to be drum brake more than disc brake. And even even from a production perspective, disc brake is probably running about 30 percent on on tractors and trucks and about 15 percent for trailers or tankers. Oh, really? So, and, that, and, that, and that's right now. It's, it's ramped up dramatically mm -hmm. over the past five to 10 years, but it's still, you know, I, I talk to folks and sometimes they have this mindset that 90% of the vehicles built today have air disc brake and that's just yeah. not the case. Yeah, no. Why is the, why is the mm -hmm. trailer market slower to grow than, I mean, it's not by a whole lot, but why is it, why is it? Uh, expense more than anything else. Yeah. You, you, fleets typically spend their money more on the tractor than they do on the trailer. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, air disc brake is premium. And, and so to move to that technology on something that you typically don't like to use your, your CapEx budget for, it's, it's not where you spend your cash. Yeah. Okay. What about the um, like reduced stopping distance? law that's that's out there i don't i'm not real familiar with it, to be honest with you but i know it's out there um does that does the air disc break is that the reason why maybe that's growing as well because of that or or is performance wise they're close similar equal yeah the, the, real good question so um what what i would say brian is is that um the the u.s government has has their uh, vehicle safety regulations fmvss 121 in particular for brakes and it doesn't dictate one technology versus another. I think that's, that's an important thing to, to make clear here. Uh, what it does say is here's the stopping distance that you have to achieve for a tractor trailer configuration um, with, this, with two axles, three axles, four axles on, on whatever it might be. This, this is the stopping distance that you have to achieve. And so that regulation did, did change back 
uh, close to 10 years ago now. Um, in 2011, there was the first phase of it. Uh, there was another phase that came through in 2013, and, and it was shortening up the distance for stopping that tractor trailer configuration. Um, the, the regulation pertained solely to the tractor, didn't apply to the trailer, didn't apply to, to a straight truck, um, but, but it said, you got to stop the vehicle faster. And so uh, the various brake manufacturers looked at and said, based on what we have today, can we achieve this with the existing technology or do we have to go with a different technology? And so, so some suppliers looked at and said, um, we, we've got this share of, of the existing technology, let's say that's drum brake, and, and we think air disc brakes the future, we're going to focus our time and efforts there. And, and others might have looked at it, say, from a merit perspective and said, hold on, we've got a good share on, on the drum brake side and we can still hit the number. Uh, by by uh, by good sum. So let's let's look at maybe widening the the line brake shoe, um, and, and we can still achieve it with a drum brake versus having to jump to the expense of going to air disc brake. From a performance perspective, uh, I, you know I don't think you'd find an engineer that, that wouldn't say, well, air disc brake can can stop you a little bit tighter. However, when you're looking at the mandate side, Meritor is very conservative about how it approaches its testing. We're going to make sure that the, we're not only achieving what the regulation requires, but putting a healthy margin, let's say 10% additional distance or more to, to, to make sure that everybody's safe in how they operate those vehicles. So uh, it, there, there's a lot to reduce stopping distance. Um, it's still confusing um, from an aftermarket perspective. Some of the things that we often educate folks on are, um, you know, first and foremost, uh, Meritor or other brake manufacturers aftermarket suppliers can't certify a, a friction material as reduced stopping distance compliant or RSD compliant. Uh, it can be marketed that way. There's no government regulation or law that prohibits that, but, but technically speaking, the folks that actually certify reduced stopping distance are the vehicle manufacturers themselves. So that, that nameplate has said this vehicle, based on this, this axle setup, on the rest of the configuration of the vehicle and this specific brake with friction mix, this achieves the stopping distance. So it's it's not a, when we go out and talk to, to maybe a, a dealer group and, and they ask a question about reduced stopping distance and, and Meritor, we'll say, we have a, an RSD compliant friction for your vehicle nameplate, but your nameplate, your home office actually was the one that did the engineering certification uh, we just provided them the options to be able to, to say this is what they want to use and this achieves that that shorter distance of stopping. Got so that, that's that's something to keep in mind. And the, the other that we get into is because there's no requirement um, for what what is used in the aftermarket, whether we're talking reduced stopping distance or in general uh, on friction material, it doesn't have to be FMVSS 121 tested and approved, though Meritor does that for all mixes. That, that we use, whether it's a drum brake or disc brake application, um, you'll get folks that had RSD friction initially on that vehicle. Again, any, any vehicle, let's say safely since 2013, those sums start as early as 2011 on the tractor side, mm -hmm. and the second owner of the vehicle. We're, we're far enough out, maybe the start of the third owner of that vehicle. They might not choose to replace reduced stopping distance friction with reduced stopping distance friction. They might go to something else. And there's nothing that stops them from that. But what we educate on is that that vehicle was built for reduced stopping distance to achieve a certain distance. And if you don't have that friction mix, that specific one, you may not, uh, you may not stop as properly. Therefore, you may not be operating as safely. Um, and, and it's not just the friction material that changed because we actually were moving Meritor as well as others to accomplish this. You're moving more of the, the brake, uh, the brake force to the front or steer axle. Mm -hmm. You're moving, I think something like five, five percent uh, of the brake force from, from the drive axle or the trailer axle, you're, you're bringing it forward. And so with that, you have to make different things more robust. So there are changes to things like brake spiders or to the, the bolts that are used. You have to change the, uh, the brake chamber. Uh, historically it would have been a type 20 on a steer axle or front axle, now it's a type 24. So there are a number of different items or components that change to achieve this. And it's not just a friction mix. And if you did remove the friction mix that was there initially, you may not stop to the degree that you should have if you maintained it the whole way through. So it's not a, 
not intended to be a scare tactic. It's hey, this is this is physics. You yeah. you can change a lot of things in life. You can't change physics a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to add, that was one of my questions is asking you if the reduced stopping distance, if that was going to be improved by like simply pure friction formulation, like just better formulation or, or better. It, it's it's a different mix, um, but but it's not, and you can retrofit a, a non-RSD built tractor to RSD friction, but there's not necessarily a, a specific formula that you are going to achieve this many feet shorter in stopping distance or this percentage shorter stopping distance because you got all those other components. And so if you made the change to the steer axle, um, you are probably gonna have to change out the brake spider. Well, few folks are gonna wanna undertake that additional expense. Mm. They're gonna wait till the next time they, they buy a vehicle and they're gonna take care of it. And um, for steer axles, historically they're 15 inch uh, for brake shoe, but now they some of them oftentimes are more 16 and a half inch. So they've gone, longer as well as wider. And so do you have the clearance in the envelope on, on the vehicle to actually pull that off? That becomes a, a aspect of discussion. These topics. So what, uh, I guess before we get off here, so what are you, um, what are, what's the outlook for that you guys are seeing at Meritor as far as, you know, this year, it, you know, are this, you expecting sales to increase or, you know, from as far as a market perspective? Right. Uh, well, I, I, I think what, what, caught many folks in, on the commercial vehicle side uh, off, uh, off last year, uh, aside from pandemic conditions and, and how do we respond with this and that, it, it was that in general, the production build was stronger than what was initially forecast as we went from 2019 into 2020. Hmm. So as we go from 20 into 21, I, I think in general, folks are optimistic, both on a production as well as an aftermarket side. Uh, we've seen uh, aftermarket demand has certainly improved uh, dramatically. I think probably the low, low point would have been in that March to, to May timeframe of last year. And then it's, it's steadily improved. I, I, I think it's probably also safe to say it may be down a little bit versus the prior year, but it's not down dramatically. So it's close to where it was. And that, that's a good thing. Um, there, there are plenty of trucks. Folks are buying lots of goods. They're having things delivered to their homes. Um, so, so that, that means trucks are on the road. That means there, there are parts that are needed. And so that, that's, um, for, for us in terms of an outlook, there, there's some positive things to be done there. And, and we're excited with both the products and services that, that we've gotten lined up to roll out this year to, to make things better for both our, our distribution partners and our end users. Great. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. I, I uh, look forward to doing this again in the future.